I want to welcome you all in Zoom land tonight to the January 2024 meeting of the Oregon Archaeological Society. Our speaker tonight is Hayden Kingery. Hayden is a recent Jones Scholarship winner, and so he comes and he makes a presentation to us, our group, as part of the requirements for getting that scholarship and using it. Hayden's currently a PhD student at Washington State University. He earned a BA in Anthropology and History from the University of Oregon and received an MA a couple of years later from the University of Nevada, Reno. He's now working on his PhD. Uh, his, his dissertation involves, involves using residue analysis of stone tools and coprolites to identify ancient diets and foraging behaviors of early Holocene people from the Great Basin and Southern Columbia Plateau. He currently works at the Environmental Archaeology Research Lab at Washington State University. Tonight, he is presenting a, a, a talk entitled, The Invisible Season, Identifying Spring Root Processing with Starch Grain Analysis at an Early Holocene Rabbit Drive Site. Hayden, knock yourself out. Thank you all uh, for having me here. And I just want to say, uh, in regards to the Oregon Archaeological Society, thank you so much uh, for the uh, acceptance of the Roy F. Jones uh, Scholarship. Uh, those funds went directly towards uh, the protein residue analysis that I'm going to be presenting to you today, uh, as well as contributing to uh, my master's thesis. So. To anyone that saw my defense uh, in 2022, uh, this will look very familiar. Uh, but for those who didn't see it, uh, I hope you have uh, a fun time uh, seeing what I was doing down at University of Nevada, Reno, working with Jeff Smith. And uh, like what was mentioned, my uh, paper today, my presentation will be on the invisible season and identifying spring root processing with starch grain analysis at an early Holocene rapid drive site, LSP1 in the North Warner Valley. So starting in 2010, uh, Jeff Smith out at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, surveyed and excavated within the North Warner Valley and specifically the Little Steamboat Point One rock shelter, which uh, the Little Steamboat Point itself is in the background there of the photo. Uh, and based on the recommendations from Bill Cannon at BLM uh, of potential issues with looting at the site. It was requested that UNR archeologists and uh, students and colleagues go out and excavate the site. And from there, uh, we found that there is a rapid drive that had happened there from the early Holocene and into the late Holocene. So over almost 10,000 years of continual rapid drives happening in the North Warner Valley. And you, you can read all of this in the uh, monograph edited by Jeff Smith uh, in the shadow of the steamboat from the University of Utah Press. Uh, that's my little plug in there. Uh, also, I just want to shout out that uh, along with uh, the Roy F. Jones Scholarship, my colleague at the University of Nevada, Reno, Megan McGinnis, also won this award and I believe gave a presentation, uh, now I can say last year, uh, and uh, this was our reaction when we uh, saw that we had won the same scholarship. We were very confused when we got the same email and went, oh, great, we both got it. And I think it contributed to two uh, uh, pretty good theses. Uh, real quickly, I want to start off with uh, a quick land acknowledgement. The LSP-1 rock shelter is located in the traditional homelands of the northern Paiute and Klamath people, and the tools that I studied ultimately belong to their ancestors. And the majority of this study was done at the University of Nevada, Reno, which is situated on the traditional homelands of the Northern Paiute, Washoe, Western Shoshone, and Southern Paiute people. So I'm gonna go over a very quick rundown of the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. And anyone uh, who's attended multiple of these Oregon, Oregon Archaeological Society meetings, uh, listening to Dennis Jenkins or any of the stuff that has come out about the Paisley Caves might be aware of these paradigms. But it's important background nonetheless for this project. So on the right here, we have uh, lake levels within the Warner Basin, which uh, over 10,000 years ago was Lake Warner, a pluvial lake uh, fed from the rain and drained into the basin itself. 
And we start with the bowling alarod, uh, about 14.7 to 12.9 thousand cal BP. And let's see, there we go. Characterized as a fairly dry and uh, warm climate relative to the last glacial maximum that took place before it. And based off of uh, lake level studies in the Warner Basin, lake levels dropped uh, quite a bit from their uh, late, uh, excuse me, last glacial maximum levels. Later, we have the Younger Dryas uh, at the end of the Pleistocene from 12.9 to 11.6 thousand Cal BP, characterized as a fairly cool and wet environment. So we have a bit of a peak back up in lake levels around that time. Uh, by the early Holocene, between 11.6 and 9,000 Cal BP, it gets drier again. So as you're seeing, you're seeing this uh, large fluctuations in lake levels over thousands of years between the Pleistocene and Holocene. And this transition can be noted by just the extreme differences in climate within this region, something that the people that have been living here for time immemorial have been experiencing. And the early Holocene uh, quickly uh, by nine to 5,000 Cal BP within the middle Holocene gets exceptionally hot and exceptionally dry. Seeing You almost see uh, the disappearance of Lake Warner uh, within the area. And you see that within the archeological record too, just a sheer drop off in people uh, within this time period. And then finally, within the late Holocene, within the last 5,000 years, uh, it returns to re uh, levels today, which we only really see it in the South Warner Valley uh, with the lake levels retreating from the north. So this period from the Bowling Alarod to the middle Holocene uh, is a time of uh, climactic changes within the Warner Basin in Southern Oregon and within the Northern Great Basin in general. Uh, something we're all, I think, very familiar with, the Paisley Cave coprolites here. Here's a glamour shot of one of them. Uh, so, uh, with evidence from, uh, especially from Cooper's Ferry, uh, within the last year, we've seen that people have been within uh, south of the North American glaciers in North America, probably got here between 17.5 and 14.6 thousand Cal BP. Uh, Cooper's Ferry is uh, pushing back uh, on that lower date there. And we also have potentially older dates from evidence with white sands, but that uh, those studies are still ongoing. But as far as within the Great Basin, our earliest evidence of people is around 14.2 Cal, uh, 14.2 thousand Cal BP, uh, which is uh, right at the time of the Bowling Alarod. So people have been here for, as evidenced by Paisley Caves, for these times of great uh, uh, climactic changes. <laughs> And these people are associated oftentimes with the Western stem tradition. Uh, these large stemmed points, uh, uh, which are a lithic typology and technology uh, that is the oldest uh, within the Great Basin, uh, as evidenced by, again, Paisley Caves. Uh, the people associated with these tools are characterized as highly mobile foragers based off of small occupation uh, assemblages, as well as a lack of storage pits or any sort of sedimentary, uh, uh, or excuse me, sedentary uh, architecture or anything like that. So highly mobile foragers. And based off of studies from copper lights and uh, from hearths from sites like Paisley Caves, Fort Rock Cave, uh, Conley Cave, we find that people within the Great Basin are actually consuming a very broad diet. So something that we're pushing up against is people aren't just hunting these big mammals uh, such as bison or mammoth uh, that you might suspect with these very large projectile points, but they're also consuming uh, low, calorically low rank seeds that we find in copper lights, that we find in hearths, uh, going well into the bowling alarod period. So uh, this is important because we don't really see a high frequency in ground stone until about 9,000 Cal BP within the Great Basin. So we have this aspect of people have always been consuming seeds and it isn't until about 9,000 Cal BP that we see ground stone frequencies increase uh, uh, to a point that's fairly noticeable and it indicates this increased processing of seeds within 
the Great Basin. So taking these low rank seeds, instead of maybe just snacking on them or whatever they might be doing with them, actually intensively pounding them and grinding them into like a flour or mush uh, that is uh, uh, calorically nutritious. Uh, as we go into talking about the ground stone within the Great Basin, it's important to talk about uh, a lot of what we understand about Great Basin groundstone archaeology uh, comes from the ethnographic record. Uh, going back to Julian Stewart in Utah at Danger Cave, it was always suspected that by the early Holocene, people picked up uh, uh, groundstone to process intensively seeds. But the ethnographic record also shows a large diversity of elements that are consumed or processed by groundstone uh, by Native Americans. So not just seeds, but that also includes roots and underground storage organs. It includes animal meat, pollen, such as cattail, uh, can be ground into a cattail cake. Uh, I've never tried it. I'd be very interested to see what that tastes like. Uh, we also see insects, also things that aren't food elements, such as uh, pigment and toolstone. And as well, uh, as archeologists, sometimes we get uh, so caught up in the nutritional or caloric uh, strengths of certain foods, but there's also medicinal purposes, such as potential psychoactive substances or uh, elements that might bring spiritual health to Native Americans. So these are all elements that groundstone is associated with, and there is a distinct diversity of uses for groundstone. All right, with all that out of the way, uh, introduction to LSP-1. Do I get a little? Oh yeah, I do get a little laser pointer. So LSP one is uh, within this large uh, series of rock shelters. LSP one being the largest of them. Uh, letter A there is a uh, individual for scale, so you can kind of see how large the rock shelter is relative to a person. Kind of hard to see. Uh, and we have B here, uh, allogenic deposits of sediments uh, outside the. Uh, rock shelter that contributed to much of the burying of the site. Uh, and here it is location-wise uh, within the Northern Great Basin, Southern Oregon, uh, in the North Warner Valley. Uh, this is a photo uh, kind of showing the pluvial lakes at their maximum within the uh, late Pleistocene, just to show the, the Great Basin at this time was very wet and had many pluvial lakes. Uh, but as it got drier within the early Holocene, those lakes quickly disappeared, and we see a transition within the archaeological assemblage, and particularly from an increase in groundstone. Now, LSV-1 is unique for the fact that it has deposits that date to the early Holocene, and when if within that uh, deposit, we have many, many groundstone, about uh, over 100 groundstone within the lowest deposit. So that's from stratum 5 uh, and below, dating to between 9,700 Cal BP and 8,000 Cal BP. Based off of uh, archeological excavations done there, there is no real middle Holocene deposit there based off of the hearths and uh, deposits that are found there. Uh, we don't really find radiocarbon dates for that period associated with hearths. Uh, and we also don't see uh, uh, tool points that are associated with the middle Holocene. So there is an early Holocene record uh, within stratum five and below, as well as people returning in the late Holocene, uh, stratum four and above between 4,500 and 900 Cal BP. Hey, we and for the, the uh, rest of my talk, I will be focusing primarily on the early Holocene deposits. Now, what makes this site uh, Important and unique is the fact of its age associated with radio uh, with uh, rabbit drives uh, and a large number of early Holocene small game bones. These small game bones being primarily rabbits and hares, jack rabbits, cottontail, pygmy rabbits. Uh, about fifty nine thousand uh, uh, small game bones found within this deposit, making up a large percentage of the overall deposits of small game bones within the site. Uh, but along with that, we also have 141 groundstone within that same deposit relative to the Middle Archaic and Late Archaic. So again, we're focusing on the early Holocene, the late Paleo-Indian component uh, associated with Western stem points. Uh, 
In this late uh, Paleo-Indian component, if we're seeing this much groundstone, we should also be seeing a large number of seeds, as seeds are associated with groundstone processing. However, we're finding that while we have a large number of groundstone, we have relatively fewer seeds compared to the middle and late archaic. So seeds that would have been harvested during the fall, uh, such as cattail, wild rye, goosefoot, and other grasses, and uh, quinoams. But uh, this raises the question, though, if we have this many groundstone but not a lot of seeds, it raises the question, what are the groundstone being used for? And this is where I come in as a eager young master student uh, to look at uh, these groundstone hypotheses. Uh, either one, groundstone were being used to grind rabbits and other small mammals associated with the rabbit drive. Uh, this will be answered with protein residue analysis. Uh, number two, uh, that they're grinding underground storage organs such as roots. And uh, three, that they are being used to process seeds. Uh, the latter two would be answered using starch grain analysis. Uh, I looked at overall, out of the 141 Paleo-Indian groundstone, I looked at 48 working surfaces, so 46 tools total for protein residue. And on 27 of those same groundstone, I also analyzed the starch grains on those same uh, groundstone. Uh, here's just a quick overlook of where these were sourced from the, for the uh, protein residue analysis, trying to get a wide dispersal to see if there's any groupings within the profile of LSP1. Uh, so when I when a ground zone was large enough that it could be both sampled for protein residue analysis as well as starch grain analysis, uh, I did a wash with distilled water and a toothbrush on one part of the ground stone and then concentrated that. So all we have left is the starch grain samples, but that also made sure that there were samples left behind that could be used for protein residue analysis. So in total, I looked at five different families of animals. So obviously we're interested in whether the rabbits were being processed, but there were also other zooarchaeological remains found there, such as deer. Uh, we are looking also for ferrets uh, or, or the ferret family, which includes badgers that was found there, uh, looking for bird protein as well as rat protein to identify some of these other elements. So when we went through 48 working surfaces, uh, we looked, went through and didn't find any evidence for badger, uh, no evidence for deer, that's fine. We weren't really interested in that. We're interested in the small animals, really no evidence of sage grouse uh, being consumed there. That makes sense. No rats. That's all good. We're still interested in the rabbits that were consumed during this rabbit drive and absolutely no evidence uh, whatsoever of any of these on all the ground stone, which is quite unique considering uh, how protein residue works. Out of 48 samples, uh, we didn't find any uh, evidence of protein. Uh, this uh, protein residue analysis was also done at AINW. A and uh, Maybe this is due to denaturalization or preservation issues with uh, protein, but in the past, a crescent from the same deposit was also submitted to AINW or AINW, uh, and uh, it came back with pronghorn protein. So obviously protein, uh, to some extent, preserves on stone tools from the site. So this uh, leans towards the way of, well, these ground stone hey, most likely are not being slide. used to process these animals that were tested for, which are the most likely candidates if animal remains are being processed here. We can't see the so, slides on Zoom. Well, that uh, kind of sucks. Uh, all that protein residue analysis done and no returns, but no data is, or uh, no results are still results. And uh, we move on to the protein or the starch grain analysis. Here's a photo of me with longer hair uh, sampling those ground stone. Uh, as well as analyzing them under a microscope under both bright field and cross-polarized light. And much better results than the protein residue analysis. So uh, no need to really look at the numbers for the total starch grains, but you can see that out of the uh, 27 working surfaces that were analyzed for starch grains, uh, 
25 of them came back with at least the presence of some starch grains. So starch grains are preserving on these groundstone and uh, are pretty prevalent throughout the deposit. So regardless of what the identification is, just to begin with, the presence of starch grains shows that plants were being processed at this site. Uh, in association with uh, Elizabeth Lauterbach and Stefania Wilkes at the University of Utah, who helped walk me through some of the methods for starch grain analysis, as well as uh, using some of their comparative analyses for biscuit root. Uh, to look for evidence of underground storage organs, we focus on just lamatium or biscuit root from the, uh, that was collected from the Warner Valley. And using these modern comparatives, uh, we found that uh, starch grains from biscuit root are typically round or spherical with uh, these straight distinct extinction crosses that you see in cross polarized light. Uh, there are some other elements there such as uh, these scars or fissures across there. Uh, as well as pressure facets. So they might be fairly round, but some of them have also uh, a slightly uh, straighter edge right there. And we find this uh, on the archaeological assemblages. Just comparing them, they look very similar. They, ha they both have these straight uh, extinction crosses. Some of them also have uh, that scarring there. So pretty great evidence that biscuit root is being processed there. To look for seeds, we analyze for wild rye. Uh, uh, starch grains that come from wheat, rye, and barley are fairly similar. They're in the tribe of Tritiaceae, uh, and they're fairly flat in distinct extinction crosses. You can see not quite as clear, uh, and we find these also in the archaeological assemblage. So if they're flat and have those indistinct, extinct, uh, indistinct extinction crosses, uh, we identify them as wild rye. So we're finding both roots and seeds at, uh, at the site, specifically biscuit root, and wild rye seeds. We also found a large number of unidentified starch grains, but we found it was more important to look at specific types of starch grains rather than trying to identify every single starch grain, such as we're seeing these aggregate compounds that you see on the top there, multiple starch grains grouped together, uh, these polyhedral 3D shaped ones. So they have, instead of being round, they have multiple straight edges. Uh, None of these really match any sort of uh, ev uh, evidence of contamination, such as something like maize or potato, which is fairly distinct. So no evidence that any of these starch grains are coming from in the lab or modern contaminants. Uh, we're also seeing ones with, instead of a centric hilum, which is the center of the cross polarized light, we're seeing them on the edge. And this one in particular, just going back through, uh, I'm seeing a couple that look fairly similar to within the Liliaceae family, which is uh, some like Mariposa lily. So again, adding to this idea that a diversity of plants are being consumed at the site. Uh, and here's uh, the number of biscuit root starch grains. I, obviously, 61 biscuit root starch grains, 46, and then 790 unidentified starch grains. So obviously, there's a lot of starch grains here that uh, were identified as starch grains, but don't really match our biscuit root or wild rye. Uh, knowing more about modern uh, comparative references can help us understand that a little bit more. But at the end of the day, we're finding starch grains that look like biscuit root, that look like wild rye with a high degree of confidence. And we're finding that across uh, the working surfaces, 17 had biscuit root, 12 with wild rye, and wild rye also only was found on ones that also had biscuit root, which is fairly interesting. Here's a, another summary of kind of those percentages of the number of tools and working surfaces and what percentage of them had uh, uh, certain starch, had starch grains, biscuit root starch grains, as well as wild rye and biscuit root starch grains. The number in particular here I just want to draw your attention to is the non-portable matates. So these are the large, thick matates that are from locally uh, sourced toolstone are from the site close. Uh, one of the biggest matates there was about 50 kilograms. And as someone who personally drove it up from Reno to Portland to get it tested for protein residue analysis, I can say people aren't carrying that across a landscape. So we'll come back to this, but it's fairly significant. 65% of the non-portable matates had both biscuit root and wild rye. Uh, here's where they were sampled from in profile in the profile. Uh, 
no real clustering that we found, but kind of throughout we're seeing both biscuit root and wild rye. So what this brings up is earlier uh, when Jamie Kennedy uh, at the University of Oregon for her dissertation looked at the macrobotanical analysis of this site, found that it was primarily fall seeds. And along with this ethnographic idea that rabbit drives are done in the fall, um, it was interpreted to be a fall occupation. However, with direct evidence of USOs or underground storage organs, which would have been uh, processed or collected in the spring, uh, this suggests that people were coming to the site multiple times a year, uh, multiple years. So not just in the fall, but also taking the advantage of the roots that would have been growing in the uplands. Uh, so correlates for root camps based off Prouty 1994, uh, access the uplands, which LSP1 has, groundstone tool, tool abundance, which as we've been talking about, definitely has. Uh, hearths, um, there's likely more unexcavated hearths from the site uh, based off of cluster analysis of the groundstone kind of near the mouth of the rock shelter, but that wasn't excavated, but there are hearths within, uh, or hearth features within that uh, sedimentary deposit, uh, as well as charred macrobotanical remains, which uh, Jamie Kennedy found. So all of these add up to this idea that not only is it a rabbit drive site or the site where people will be processing rabbits, but it would also be the site for spring root processing. And the last piece of evidence that kind of supports this, and not just that these are stored roots that are being processed with groundstone in the fall, but were actually being collected too, is a large number of flakestone tools. Uh, Vandervoort in 2016 found that a lot of the use where, yes, was associated with rabbit processing, but a lot of them were also associated with plant or unknown uh, use where processing. Uh, we have some, uh, like the sketch here that has this concavity uh, along the flakestone tool, which is an indication of digging stick maintenance, which is further support that not only is it processing the roots here at the site, but also collecting them during the spring. So again, when we're talking about the invisible season, as uh, Jeff liked to put it, and as will be the eventual title of this paper, uh, uh, this shows that starch grain analysis has the potential to show occupations that wouldn't otherwise be shown from the macro level, but also from the microscopic level. Uh, going back to these non-portable matates, the fact that we see multiple seasons worth of these starch grains on groundstone that aren't being carried across the landscape also suggests that these are what Lewis Binford would call site furniture. So people cache these items at important places with the intention of returning and reusing them. And the fact that we find multiple seasons of starch grains on these non-portable matates suggests that people are have the intention of going back to an important place like LSP1, like the North Warner Valley, with the intention of... Uh, utilizing the ecology and the area uh, and the traditional ecological knowledge that is associated with this landscape. And also suggests that unlike what we have this idea of the early hall saying, oh, it's really tough. People have to have these ground sown. They're eating seeds. No, it's a fairly good time and, and actually a draw multiple times a year for people to come there. Uh, and finally, the nutritional ecology and uh, indicators implication that starch is a really important source of carbohydrates in the past as well as today. And there's a, a, a term used uh, for rabbit starvation. It's known as uh, protein poisoning when you eat too much protein, too much lean meat with not enough fat or carbohydrates. So something like a rabbit drive, you kind of need carbohydrates to live. It's not just a want, but also a necessity that you need carbohydrates. So the fact that people are sourcing for seeds is not necessarily a need for calories because there's plenty of rabbits being consumed here, but also a large need for seed processing for the starchy carbohydrates that are associated with it. So uh, not only is there a broad diet there with lots of calories, but also a need for nutritional intake as well. So this kind of goes against some of our ideas of the diet breath model or human behavioral ecology, that it's all about calories. Well, some extent, you can have all the calories in the world, but if you don't have enough fat and carbohydrates to go along with those proteins, you might be in some trouble. So in summary, 
people didn't grind rabbits with ground stone based off of the evidence that I found. Uh, the ground stone that I looked at, the 48 working surfaces didn't have any evidence of rabbits or any other animals being processed. But there is evidence for the grinding of roots and seeds across multiple seasons. Uh, our starch grain analysis also shows LSP1 was not only a fall rabbit drive site, but also a spring root camp. Uh, the large non-portable matates were used in a sense like site furniture, as Lewis Benford would have called it, with the intention of people coming multiple times a year. Carbohydrates are an important dietary nutrient within the Northern Great Basin throughout the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, as evidenced by, even though they have a lot of rabbits and a lot of protein, a lot of calories, they, they need their carbs. So, uh, and in the future, along, this is my thesis uh, that I've written up. In the future, we're looking, this is just one site. But I'm hoping that with these methods that I've used here, using protein residue analysis, starch grain analysis, that this can be applied to a broader regional study, uh, understanding the adoption of ground stone during the Pleistocene Holocene transition. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Burns of Paiute tribe and uh, Klamath tribe, as well as the following individuals and institutions, particularly the Oregon Archaeological Society. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank my family for their time. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, good. good. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. So, uh, we got anybody got questions for, for Hayden? Uh, to rephrase your question, were these plants also being uh, sources of vitamins and minerals and other micronutrients? Absolutely. So, the nutritional ecology model that was kind of developed as a bit of a rival to calorically based models. Uh, suggests that the importance is not just the macronutrients, protein, fat, lipids, carbohydrates, but also a need for vitamins and minerals that are necessary for healthy reproduction and healthy lives, and uh, such as uh, the vitamins and minerals that are in these plants that can't always be sourced from lean rabbits. So yes, absolutely. The question was, uh, did they... Uh, uh, was there any evidence of camas processing there? Uh, no evidence macroscopically from the macrobotanical analysis. Camas is also starch deficient. So not all plants have starch grains. So you couldn't be able to do a starch grain analysis to identify camas. Don't worry, I'm trying to figure out how to identify camas molecularly, uh, microscopically. Uh, but we don't really have any evidence of camas at this site. Um, and researchers right now that I, I know are kind of working on how can we identify it microscopically. Uh, there's also a lot of evidence, especially in the plateau region, that instead of processing camas with ground stone, you're actually more likely to process that through earth ovens. So, which kind of uh, is a better source of uh, getting the calories from inulin-based camas and wild onions rather than starchy plants like biscuit root or... Uh, starchy plants like seeds. Is this intentional modification of the landscape in regards to rabbits or plants? Uh, there is no, from this site specifically, there's no direct evidence that people are doing kind of a horticultural, like taking roots and taking them across the landscape. Plenty of evidence of that in the ethnographic record with Northern Paiute people, actually uh, certain species of Lomatium and biscuit root are very important and only grow in specific regions. So they might actually be traded very long distance. So you might actually see some of that. And based off of this site, rabbit drives, which kind of are thought to be a, a later activity have been going on for time immemorial, almost 10,000 years. Uh, so I think there's absolutely potential that people are transporting certain species across a landscape. A little tough to tell with starch grain analysis. Sometimes we can't get to the species level. Maybe we can on certain things, but uh, I think there's absolutely uh, potential to look for maybe plants that don't belong, right? That I, I, I'll just do a quick shout out here. Elizabeth Lauterbach, who helped me with my starch grain analysis, is looking at Four Corners Potato in the uh, Four Corners region and uh, kind of looking at that movement throughout the region and the pseudo uh, domestication of potatoes there. So shout out to Elizabeth Lauterbach for that. Is there the potential that they were collected from the ground or were they uh, directly processed or were they heated first? Uh, not really any evidence of that from the starch grain analysis. We do find some broken kind of misshapen starch grains. If uh, I had the 
photo back up of those other starch grains, some of them look like they're kind of gelatinized or breaking down from the starch grain into their carbohydrates. So that could be an indication from the processing and grinding or from uh, the, uh, the heating element of it. But that is something that you do find. Some ethnographic records talk about them taking it out of the ground, mushing it up, and then cooking it that way, or maybe heating it and drying it out before they process it. So there's a couple different processes of how to uh, consume biscuit root in the ethnographic record. So I wasn't a part of the excavations. Oh, sorry. Uh, how how large was the area that was excavated? Uh, it was excavated in one by one meter units. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head about how big, but about the, sorry for people in Zoom, but about the area of this, uh, probably this planetarium, this middle section here. Yeah, about about the floor level. Uh, so it's a a rock shelter site that could comfortably fit about seven people if they seven to ten people if they cram themselves into the rock shelter so that's about the size of the rock shelter and most likely extended outside the rock shelter but the only parts that were excavated uh within that period was the interior of it and not so much the mouth yeah uh the question was would i be able to do a radiocarbon date of the starch grains uh they are made of carbon so there is a potential there uh there has been other microbotanical uh, studies that have done radiocarbon dates. I think the most notable one recently, uh, famously or infamously, is the White Sands site had recently uh, radiocarbon dated pollen uh, from sediment samples. So there is the possibility, but I don't think there'd be enough to be collected uh, that could accurately radiocarbon date uh, the starch grains on the groundstone. So plus, you've got lots of fire hearths right next to the ground. yeah there's hearths there that help with the dating so so the question or the comment i guess was uh explaining the extraction process and that's the part that i kind of got past but it was essentially using a very specialized brush that's not a toothbrush uh that's been cleaned uh with sodium hydroxide and then distilled water to kill any contaminant starch grains that might have been on it uh brushed it with distilled water collected that runoff uh, from it, so scrubbed it, pretty much collected the dirt uh, from the uh, ground stone. Then that's put through a centrifuge uh, to concentrate it, and then you put in a heavy density liquid uh, that just gets the starch grain uh, layer. So it ideally gets the starch grains out, maybe a little bit of pollen, uh, but you get rid of any of the uh, heavier stuff such as phytoliths or the, the sediment. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much, Hayden. Thank, thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate that. Nice, yes. nice presentation. Thank you so much.